Welcome to Timelines, episode 269. We recorded this interview at The Collective in Reno, Nevada. Always wonderful to go back to The Collective. They've got a really nice place now in studio. It just came out nice. Our guest today is Chris Webster. Chris is an archaeologist, author, podcaster, business owner, and archaeofuturist. His passion is on public education, outreach, making commercial field archaeology more efficient, and for raising the quality of life for archaeological field technicians. Now, without further ado, let's get right into this episode with Chris. Welcome to Timeline. Today we have Chris Webster, and Chris is an amazing guy. We're in Reno, Nevada, by the way, at The Collective. So, Chris, welcome to Timelines. Thank you, Bill. So, you know, where do I start with a guy like you? Because you're, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> you're the exact type of people we want on Timelines, but you're also a podcaster. So we have Podcasters Home, and we have a, like a track of podcasters who get on mm-hmm. Timelines. So we're going to start with a lot of things. You just came back, though, from Podcasters Movement. Yes. So we're going to talk about no more than two minutes about Podcasters Movement. Tell us what was the biggest impression you take away from Podcasters Movement. The biggest thing I took away from Podcast Movement was – the 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 extreme two things really the extreme variety of podcasts that are out there and things people are podcasting about and that are passionate about and that want to tell other people about and the fact that there's about a million different ways you can set up to do this you can you know whether you've got a different kind of computer recording devices microphones an iPhone it, it doesn't matter you can set up a podcast talking about your passion and if you do it right and you focus on content which was the other big takeaway content not gear i mean you want it to sound good but if you focus on delivering good content and being authentic with your listeners you can probably monetize that even if it's a niche show that's good so what you take away there they're telling you focus on content not Mm -hmm. on on equipment and systems and processes the word if i had to pick one word to describe the thing i heard the most was be authentic (laughs) that's what everybody said was be authentic if you're trying to rep if you're trying to just recreate somebody else's show or their format and I mean, you can learn from people you you respect, but if you're trying to just recreate what they're doing and create another on fire podcast or something like that, you're you're not being authentic. You're just duplicating. Bring your own voice to the table and right. bring your own ideas to the table. Well, no matter who you are, even if you're sort of following another format, you're still going to be your own person, absolutely, and your own thoughts. Yeah. So driving on, you um, it was down in Anaheim, California. Yep. And we're up in Reno. Yep. It's a way. So you drove down three ninety five and you came back five. I did. And what yep. do you do while you're driving? I listen to podcasts, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I love. It. I feel so good because I found a podcaster in Reno. And sometimes <laughs> Reno is a unique place, folks. I love Reno. I love Nevada. Uh, it's definitely not California, though. Definitely not. The technologies. And I think sometimes we're like 10 years behind the Bay Area, on, yeah. you know, whether it's real estate or wherever it might be. Right. So we're in the collective. Tell us about the collective and what you do here and how long you've been podcasting. So the Reno Collective um, is now, as of about two months ago, housed in a in what used to be called Granny's Recording Studio, and uh, we we're using most of the space for co-working spaces. That's what you can see back behind us here, and and we're kind of in what we're calling the maker space right now. Actually, they call it the holodeck, but uh, that's another term. Anyway, so people just come here and they work. I have a resident desk here, which means I have my computers, my business. I'm running it basically out of the collective, and we also have a podcast studio back there, which I do most of my recording from. Um, and I, I started podcasting about five years ago. I had a show that I've taken off the internet entirely because it was horrific. That that's what happens when you first start podcasting. I didn't even want to listen to it. It was so bad. I did it for a year, but it busted my podcasting chop, so to speak. I learned a lot. And then I started the panel style um, educational show that I always kind of wanted, but but really wasn't ready to start until I got that first one under my belt. So. I started that, and then about three years later, I started the Archaeology Podcast Network because I wanted to talk about more things on different shows. So I said, well, let's assume we're going to be ambitious and and bring in other shows eventually, even if I'm just starting one more show. And I found a co-founder who's Tristan Boyle over in Scotland, and um, we we both basically started this thing. We run it under my company heading of DigTech, under my, my cultural resource management firm, and uh and now we have 17 shows on the website and that, put that, it out. Folks, that's amazing. I saw 17 shows and said, I don't know how you have any time to do anything <laughs> else. And I know how he actually makes a living. You, not many people really make a living from podcasting. Not really, no. I mean, it is very difficult. I know a few folks, I've interviewed some people are making five to 7,000. Yeah. But it takes some work to make. You have to have other things, affiliates, mm-hmm. donations, all that. Yeah. But how do you make your real money? I make my real money with my CRM firm. And in this context, a lot of people hear CRM and they think something else. But in this context, it's cultural resource management. So it's contract archaeology that's federally mandated in advance of like federal projects. Here in Nevada, it's gold mines, silver mines, solar projects, wind farms, uh, highways. Anytime federal money or permitting is required uh, for the project, 
you have to have a cultural resources assessment. It's part of an environmental impact statement or environmental assessment or other things. That so. was well said. I'm, I come from that industry, the construction industry, and that was mm-hmm. well laid out. Even the average person, I think, could understand those <laughs> concepts where you go out. And we live in a great location in the south, in the west. Yeah. And you can get from Reno to about anywhere to work. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I so cover that, Northern California, most of Reno, most of Nevada. So. And, and we have a lot of Native American sites up and down this, the Absolutely. whole west. I, and the east coast must be crazy, too. Uh, the whole country got is crazy. The civil, yeah. uh, civil war uh, yeah. issues, battlegrounds, as well as all the other. Um, they've got different. Yeah, they've got different issues they're working with on the East Coast. I've actually worked in I think eighteen different states across the country before my wife and I landed in Reno. She mm-hmm. was an archaeologist too at the time. She's wow. gotten out of it, but uh, you know we worked all over the country uh, in pretty much every region in the continental United States, and they they have different concerns and different styles of ways of doing things um, out here. Not to spend too much time on this but geologically most of our archaeology here in nevada is sitting on the surface going back you can have fifteen thousand year old artifacts sitting on the surface because there's not a lot of soil that gets deposited or created because it's a desert Mm -hmm. so for us to do a survey the first phase we just we just walk across the landscape and and see what we see and record it right 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 now i um actually environmental impact statements i'm i'm very (laughs) assessed i've I've had to deal with them left and right yeah for sure EIRs and phase ones and phase twos and we're, we're usually the uh, the first step in those things because yeah, they yeah. they have us come out to see how much more money it's going to cost them to, to develop even small projects you have to have a phase one at least for a bank will even loan yeah yes yeah. so anyway going on that's kind of neat now Chris is an entrepreneur to the nth degree he was in the Navy thanks for your Navy service thank you yeah. and he got out he went to uh, flight school yep right? I went to flight school in Tulsa Oklahoma under Spartan School of Aeronautics mm-hmm. and. After about a year there and seeing a few people transfer out, Spartan at the time just offered an associate's degree. And to be a commercial pilot, which was what the goal of everyone at that school was, you need a bachelor's degree. And they don't care what it's in. You can have a bachelor's degree in anything and they will take you. But one of the requirements for being a commercial airline pilot in the majors was a bachelor's degree. So at Spartan, you got an associate's degree from them that was basically based in aviation. And then you had to do like night courses while you flight instructed with them to build your time and your bachelor's degree. So instead of doing that, I had a more passion for knowledge and learning, and I didn't want to just learn the, the little things that they had. So I ended up transferring to the University of North Dakota, which aside from Embry-Riddle, which is a private university, um, North, University of North Dakota is the, 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 has the best flight program of any public university in the country. And I went there, finished out a lot of my flying, my, my instrument, commercial, things like that. But as I was telling telling you in the before we started talking here, I just didn't want to be a bus driver for a living, and I was filling up all my other courses with anthropology. So at some point, I dropped aviation picked up math for a little while because that was fun and then graduated with a degree in anthropology in anthropology but you're um we're not you from there though you get your master's yeah in in um archaeological, archaeological resource management yeah yeah that's even better so you got the answer yep. plus really weird combination but it, it allowed yeah. you to run businesses yeah so there's two sides you got the university professional side or like a human train team system like i was in, in afghanistan mm-hmm. and then you've got the civilian professional services side. Mm-hmm. So you, you went the entrepreneur side where you're contracting, Absolutely. pulling teams together yep. and making a living. And I don't know how you do it all. I honestly <laughs> don't know how, I know how much work it is to podcast. Yeah, it's a lot. And tell us about your network. So the archaeology podcast network, our focus is on public education and outreach. Ever, I've, I've got, it's rotating around a little bit, but I've got 18 to 22 hosts that uh, I co-host or host entirely six shows on the network and then all the other shows, um, I don't have any involvement at all in the content creation of those, but we do the editing and post-production and, and uploading of those and tracking the social media and things like that. Um, but all of our hosts are, uh, they're either graduate level archaeologists or professional archaeologists in one way or another. And they do this for a living and they podcast on the side. So Very good. Yeah. So, I mean, my hat's off. I know how much time it takes. And how many, again, how many do you edit a week? Oh, I mean, right now we've got, because we have a daily show that we're running for 2017, it's only five to 15 oh minutes, gosh. but it's every single day of the, of the, of the year. Uh-huh. And uh, that makes it about nine episodes, nine to 10 episodes a week that go up. When that ends in 2017, if I, if I don't decide to have an aneurysm and continue it into 2018, then we'll be back down to about three or four hour long shows a week. So, I mean, we could talk on forever because you've got three <laughs> or four different businesses, a lot like I am. Yeah. Um, but that's what I like. That's, you know, you'll hit something. You always have to have something that brings in the money, though, so you can continue to build something else. Yep. And eventually you'll hit it big because podcasting, there's some huge podcasters out there. If you hit the top 200. Yeah you're going to make revenues that are very large. But it, right. but there's tons of podcasts. Well, and the only thing stopping us from monetizing, because we have the numbers, we have the listeners, we're at, you know, again, I, I don't have 
solid analytics, but the analytics I do have say that we have about 71,000 monthly subscribers across the whole network. Now, some of those right. shows are more popular than others, but we have we can monetize, we can bring in money. It's really finding the time right now, which is yeah. another thing that's shifting for me right now is I'm being able to shift more time to the podcast network and I think that'll start paying the bills. Yeah, and you know, it, I think it takes a small team sometimes. You need someone yeah. out there out front generating some lead generation, some right. monetization, and someone actually doing the editing right. in a system. And that's just a, a process. I'm, yep. I'm around a lot. So with that, I'm going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back on the backside and we're going to talk about your life and success principles. And Sounds then we're going to talk about Reno and a little commercial from you, mm -hmm. and like, what do you like to eat in Reno? Where, where should we go to eat? <laughs> okay? Hey, this is Bill. Quick little commercial break. Three quick pitches. One for Karen at karenconrad.com. She's my real estate broker here in Reno, Nevada. Of course, check out and look at podcastershome.com as well as eosecrets.com. Now let's get right back to the episode with Chris. Okay, we are back to... Uh, Chris's life and success principles. So I'm going to go ahead and read all five of these and we'll go one at a time. How's that, Chris? Sounds good. So the first one is focus, F-O-C-U-S. And then two is schedule everything. Three is know the know your people and their strengths and weaknesses. Don't and four is don't be afraid to fail. And five is don't let anyone don't let anyone tell you that it doesn't work. Is that right? I That's right. It? Okay. So if one, focus. What does focus mean? So focus is an acronym. I first heard it on John Lee Dumas's EO Fire podcast, and it's 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 follow one course until success. It's something that I struggle at actually because there's so many things I want to do, and they all need to work together. Bright shiny objects. <laughs> That's right. In the military, we had that left. I know, right. I know, and it's not like. And this is why I was actually in some other stuff back in May you know, with app development and things like that for archaeology, and I had to back away from that, and it was a really tough decision mm. to make, so I could focus on building up the APN because I want to back away also from my cultural resource management firm and do less field work stuff and focus more on the public outreach. So that's kind of what I'm using right. that to keep myself centered. You know, I'm just going to sidetrack here. We're going to talk about not focusing. In the workup show, we didn't talk about it. We're not going to talk about it in detail, but one of the projects you're working on is bring some technology to archaeology. Absolutely. Which they're way behind. I know. I just went through this a couple of years ago yeah. in the social scientists. It, it's like the they're scientists. They're social scientists. They're not engineers. Right. It's they're not insane. Bring, they're not engineers. They're not bringing it to a design concept of digitizing. And yes. We could talk about that. And maybe in literature, maybe in your archaeology show or something. I, I'll tell you what. Go check out arcpodnet.com. We talk about it extensively. Right. I, I've listened to a couple episodes. <laughs> All the time. I think you were talking about politics one day. I listened to it. I'm sure we were. Stay away. Yeah, right. Okay. Number two is... Um, schedule everything yeah i mean that's just I, I know so many people in fact you know as a as a podcaster i interview a lot of people and i even use a scheduling tool online for them to i was used to just do email mm -hmm. but i'm like no here's a link go check this out whatever times are there will work for me and i still that system sends them an alert the right. day of the meeting and and if i need to cancel it it'll send them that and people still forget to show up for the interview people still forget because they don't use a calendar you know, yeah, that's the yeah. only way I can keep everything straight is if I wake up in the morning, some people look at Facebook, I look at my calendar first you thing. Electronic calendar? Yeah, electronic yeah. calendar. 5.30 in the morning, I wake up, my alarm goes off, I pull my phone over, and I look at my calendar, and I make sure I don't have something going on at 6 So what's the best <laughs> scheduling software to use? I, I use Calendly for Calendly, my scheduling right. software. I, I might be shifting to Acuity because it integrates with Squarespace a little better, and I've heard some good things about it, but I'm not really sure. But I, I really love Calendly right now. Schedule once used to be really hot. I'm using yeah. Calendly myself. Yeah. Problem is when two podcasters both have Calendly, <laughs> like you use mine, no, you all use yours. Yeah, yeah. right, it's, right. But uh, <laughs> And it's even more difficult in Reno. I'm actually doing these field interviews like this. Yeah. A lot of people aren't podcasters, and they're not techies per se. Right. So anyway, number three, Know your people and their strengths and weaknesses. Now, you pull teams together. Right. For your yeah, so one of the ways that this business of, of contract archaeology works, and, and everywhere from big, massive engineering firms, multi-million dollar firms, down to small mom and pop firms, we call them, which is basically what I am, the way they operate is they have a couple people or a team of people that are full-time on staff, and then when they have a big survey or excavation project, they hire people temporarily. And so you're constantly working with new people. You might have a team of people you work with locally, but they could be out on other projects. You might have to go to the local job boards, well, the, the ones we all use that are online, and, and pull people in. So they might be working with people that the only thing they know about them is reading their CV, you know, right. reading their resume. So one of the things I try to do when I have people is I try to really get to know them and find out, okay, what are you actually good at? What do you want to be good at? Can I help train you? Can you leave this job with some new skills, you know? Uh, but first and foremost, the client's needs 
come into play and I have to say, okay, there's a time for training and there's a time for let's get this done. And that comes down to exactly knowing what they're capable of and putting them in those spots where they're most effective. Chris, that's excellent. You know, uh, you must, you, you contract with the federal government, mostly in yes. state, I'm sure, and some jurisdictions. And, and private contractors. And private, private, private clients, yeah. I remember um, in the, the contracting in the Fed side, you had to have a special license, or not license, but number. Mm-hmm. Federally con- you have all that, and you set that yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, we're set up on, with it, all the, all the yeah. pri- proper numbers and yeah. things that you and need. And I remember yeah. that on a lot of the bids is you had the general contractor or the engineering firm or right. the ar- ar- architect. And a lot of the subcontractors, there'd be seven or eight, ten packages. And a lot of subcontractors would be the same people, just different yes. leads. Does yes. that still happen? In your that business? still happens. We're often, especially a firm like mine that just does archaeology, we'll we'll often be a second or third tier sub on a really big federal project. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, so like, you're one of the subs yeah. packaging stuff. Yeah, because because a lot of these are big environmental yeah. assessments. You have, to have your license, and you have yeah. to provi- um, certified payroll and all that good stuff. Absolutely, Do you have to bring payroll on. I have a payroll company. Yeah, yeah. yeah so you just bring that on. It's all yeah. certified. And yeah, that's the art. You, know, you went to school, business school, to figure all that out. It's a lot yeah. of work. And that little bit of um, Navy time, probably not a little bit, but you did it, what four and a half years. Yeah, and I because of the program that I took, I was made an E four pretty much immediately upon yeah. graduating, uh, getting out. So, yeah, yeah. so I was I was actually running a night shift crew on the Enterprise on the USS that's Enterprise so cool. during a cruise. I, w- I worked the seven at night to seven in the morning shift on the flight deck when I was twenty. Yeah, so I had a lot of leadership training yeah. while I was in there because they require you to take that stuff, and I appreciate it. You know, when you're sharp and young and you go in the military, yeah. you get such a head start. People oh, yeah. don't realize that four years of – they get so much – if you're if you're capable of getting the right training and you yeah. go to the right places and do the right things, Absolutely. you get a huge amount of – uh, of responsibility at a young age. But it's like anything else too, though. If you don't see those opportunities and take them, they'll pass you by and you'll waste your time there. I know so right. many people that wasted their time in the military and didn't get anything out of it. Right. But yeah. again, but they, the opportunities prob- they are probably there. didn't progress in their leadership and yeah, their exactly. duty positions and all that. Yep. So I don't want to forget this. Uh, don't don't be afraid to fail. Number four. Yeah. That's a, that's a big one because if you're if you're a, a serial entrepreneur <laughs> or yeah. if you're trying to make your business successful, there's things that you have to try and you can't, you can't let them get you down. I've tried, I've tried different things from a technology standpoint. I love trying to, every, anytime I see something, whether it's, you know, my iPhone or some little gadget or something like that, the first thing I say is, can I use this for archaeology? And I try it, and sometimes it fails, sometimes it's a success, sometimes we have to change things, or sometimes you try a whole new methodology. I've had projects that went over budget because I didn't know what I was doing first early right. on, and I lost money on the project. I can't look back on that and say, well, I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to do that again, whatever caused me to do that, but I'm going to learn from that mistake and move on and not dwell on it. Yeah, one of the ways to make money is find something that actually makes money and yeah. then repeat it over and over and over and change slowly. Absolutely. And there's pros and cons to that. Sometimes with all these, this technology is moving so fast um, that things are just changing and whole new industries are coming up. Yep. And I like in your industry, I think it's a little slow to change, probably because of the government systems and regulations, as well as the professors in the universities. Well, and it's the uh, we have a we're in a unique position in time for professional archaeology firms. A lot of those are run right now by people who got their PhDs back in the late seventies, early eighties, and they're mm-hmm. starting to retire out and and pass on to younger generations. But they're really resistant to change in technology. And I've seen that. I'm, yeah, I've seen that firsthand. Absolutely, it's just crazy. Yeah. And then five, finally, don't let anyone tell you, uh, you that you that it won't work. See, I've got so much scribble yeah. <laughs> down here. Don't let anybody tell you that it will not work. I, I have, as an archaeologist, people expect me when I when I first started doing this. People expect me to you know, toe the line and just be a field technician and then go do this. And they say, oh, well, you know, don't do that because no one's ever been have found success doing that or no one's ever done this. And, and when I started getting into podcasting, I thought from day one that when I first started my first show, which I ended up taking down, again, don't be afraid to fail, um, that podcast doesn't exist anywhere because I thought it was terrible and I didn't want it out there. And I took it down and I started another one. And from day one of starting that second podcast, I thought, this is what I'm going to end up doing. I didn't know I was going to start a network right. three years later. Podcasting can be addicting. You stayed with yeah. it five, you'll be with it forever. I, I will. And yeah. it's something, public outreach and doing these things, even if it never made me any money, I'd be doing it in some way, shape, or form. But I know that there's such a, a need and a craving for this stuff that regardless of how many people tell me you can't make money in podcasting, I know that this will pay the bills for me and other people someday. Well, there's just so many other elements. Like we talked about earlier, I have switched over in timelines to go 24 local interviews because right. I realized... For five interviews, I'm five or ten interviews one year. I 
my wife made about fifty thousand dollars in commission mm-hmm. off her connections that she made through the podcast because yeah. she, she sponsors the podcast and people get to know me and it's a relationship. So twenty four podcasts should do a hundred thousand right. dollars at least. Right. So that's so there's different ways that podcasts help in business. Absolutely, I can't. You, we're not going to go in much detail, but he has like too many podcasts. <laughs> I thought I had a lot. I have a lot of websites. Oh, we've got another one we recorded today oh that, gosh. that we haven't even published yet. I, and we went long on this interview. I like, I'm so intrigued that I'm completely changing how I do the local interviews to right. tell people more time because it's had so much fun. Okay, going to the last section here of the podcast. It's more about you and your commercial. So give me a commercial how the listener, mm-hmm. both on YouTube and on the podcast, can help you. What can we do to help you? Well, honestly, as far as the podcast network goes, um, we like people to go to our Facebook page and Twitter and things like that because all our stuff posts there. And one of the the biggest things that we need is for the public to understand more about public outreach and and archaeology and heritage and things like that. So even if you're already drinking the Kool-Aid and you love everything that we're doing, share those on your own social networks so your family and friends that don't hear these things um, can, can benefit from the information. And while you're doing that, if you like what we're doing, you know we're, we have a membership program that we just started because um, because you know I've done advertising. I'm probably going to do some more. I've done sponsoring, but I want this to be a listener supported network. And we have we're bringing in uh, you know a few hundred dollars a month right now on on memberships, and that's slowly climbing every week. And and I love it. And that's re- the one reason we have some gear and things like that because we give those uh, we give those to people and. Uh, that become our pro subscribers and we're producing learning content for these pro subscribers. So, um, you know, all kinds of different things. So I guess the, the commercial aspect, <laughs> the, the, how can you help us is to really just spread the word. The more people that hear about what we're doing and what we're trying to do, I think the better we're trying to counter things like the history channel and their shows and the discovery channel that just the ancient aliens crowd, things like that, that just this misinformation out there. You know what I am seeing though? Uh, like you said, it's starting to build is you talked earlier is in the universities now, it's funny. I'm just seeing the first podcast mm-hmm. studios pop up. You yeah. think they've been well ahead of the power curve. I right. mean, some of the geeky guys in technology were doing it, right? but not the you know, the professional fields like we do. Absolutely. Talking. And that's the well, other thing I'm person. trying to do is with the public outreach stuff is I'm, I'm passionate about podcasting in general and podcast movement just ignited this because it was right. the first thing I'd gone to that wasn't archaeology related. That was yeah. pretty much all these fields. And, and it's nice. You, you give a free one hour orientation to start podcasting here. Here at the collective. I'll tell yeah. you what, shoot them over to my free course, Podcasters Home. Absolutely. And what I like is before you go and do the perfect podcast, learn how to do just a basic quick little podcast. Yep. And that's, that's it. So as we finish up here, we always ask, you're from Reno. We didn't really ask how you got here. I mean, how do <laughs> archaeology you, how, brought me here. That's what I assume because it's yeah. a great archaeology it is. area. Greater. I mean, so much. Yeah. It's called the Great Basin. We start like the, the environment. Great, we're at the start of the part of the Great Basin starts here. Yep. In fact, we've got burners up here. <laughs> Absolutely. Burners are here in town. <laughs> burners just are here. leaving to go out in the field. Yep. Have you gone to Burning Man yet? I haven't yet, actually. Nor no. have I. I, yeah. I. I don't know if I'll make it out there as a burner myself, but it's so many people, 63,000. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. And they clean it all up, too. Yeah. They must have to use an archaeologist somewhere out there. You would think, right? <laughs> yeah. They're going to need to later. Yeah. So we'll watch that this week on TV. Yep. But uh, going out, where when I come to Reno, where should I go to eat? I'll tell you what. My wife and I... Um, when we first came here, we, we like sushi. And Reno is such a crazy place hey, for we sushi. We do have a lot of sushi here. Well, not only do we have a Come lot, on. but it's all, all you can eat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know some it's, great It's sushi crazy. Places. Yeah. One of our favorites that we go to, in, we used to live up in uh, like Ranch? Northeast. No, no. No. We used to live up in uh, Sparks. And we went there because it was close. And now it's far away because we're down in downtown Reno. We still go there. It's called The Joint. T-H-A <laughs> Joint. There's actually one down here in Reno now uh, off Virginia, but I think it's... It's different somehow. We still go to the one up in Sparks, and you we know, love it. You know, Reno has, we're a small city, and then everyone comes in on the weekends, or we have events all mm-hmm. the time. All the time. So when they all go away, it's really small, and we have all these great places. But because we have so many great restaurants here, it's because of the tourism. It Absolutely, out. yeah. There's so much to do, but that, that sounds neat. We do have a lot of sushi. It's really strange. Really strange. Somebody else talked about sushi, and we looked at the history of sushi, and it started like in L.A., and so L.A., everything comes to L.A. to here, and, <laughs> and San Francisco, and all these different cultures. You, you go somewhere else and eat sushi, and you'll get a single roll for like 12 or $14 that's really big. No, that's the one there. thing people don't realize when they come to Reno. The rolls are really tiny, but that's because you order like 10 of them and share them on the table. 
I know. know. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, Chris, we could go on and on. And we went, <laughs> you took, we probably took an extra hour and something just talking on the pre workup. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually going to start blocking more of these local pre workups. It's really a pleasure to have a local podcaster here. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate and to it. get to know you. I heard about you, and it's just nice. Outstanding. All right, Chris. Wait, goodbye. All right. Thank That's you. It. I want to thank Chris for coming on Timelines. I want to make a quick announcement too. Chris is going to start a podcast meetup group in Reno. I know I'll be part of it, probably be at the collective. So look up at the meetups to make sure when you're in Reno to look us up and attend one of the podcast meetups. In the meantime, I want to thank you again for tuning into this episode of Timelines. And if you go right here and subscribe, we'd definitely appreciate it. Take care and see you on the next Timelines. Oh, also, also, can't forget this. Please go to iTunes and leave a rating review and down below on this YouTube, if you're on YouTube, do a little comment. They really help to get us better SEO. And again, thanks.